Hello and welcome to the For Your Ears Only podcast. This is the first episode of 2024, so Happy New Year, as we'll say. And what better way to mark the new year than have a special episode? And it's special because this is our first ever guest we've had on, and who better than have Mr Matt Bauer, all the way from Australia, sunny and warm, Unlike here, where it is dark and absolutely freezing cold, minus five today. Minus five. Yes, it was not pleasant um, in any way, shape or form. Matt Bauer is a, a director and filmmaker, most recently bringing to screens The Other Fellow, which came out in 2022. This is multi-award nominated and multi-award winning documentary about the life of people called James Bond and how this name affects their lives. It has most recently been added to ITVX in the UK for you to go and view it for free. It is also on Amazon Prime and as of today it's actually on the in-flight entertainment on Emirates Flights and American Airlines. So if you would like to jet set. Pretty fancy. We are here. Um, Again thank you very much for for joining us Matt and taking the time to, to come and chat with just two we guys from Glasgow. Oh. <laughs> so um, again, we really appreciate you coming on. Um, we do have some questions for yourself about the documentary, about the world of Bond. So just for people watching this for the first time who maybe have seen the documentary or have not, um, something I would quite like to, to know is you've obviously made The Other Fellow. You've worked with a number of other movies and short films as well with that. Um, how was it you got into the, the line of work, into to filmmaking, which then led on to the, the other fellow? Yeah, hi, hi Derek. Hi, Jack. Um, yeah, I'd say good evening. It's my morning uh, here. Um, yeah, thank you for having me on. Um, I mean, I I was always a Bond fan. Um, I was. I'm actually back in my hometown here of Adelaide uh, at the moment. I think it's pretty standard. I walked out one evening and my father was watching what I now know as Moonraker, um, which I think is a good introduction kid Bond film, yeah. if, if you know what I mean. Like it just, I was like, it was about halfway through and I only saw the first half of it years later. Um, and that just got me in sort of straight away, um, you know, and it's kind of funny, even kind of in the context of this film a bit, I, I think back and it wasn't like, who is this guy? I was like, oh, that's what James Bond is. You know what I mean? It's a term, you know, you'd heard. And it was like, oh, this is James Bond. Um, and then it was like about a year later and we were on a family holiday and a friend's dad brought the VHS for the spy who loved me okay. and put that on. And then I was like, oh, there's another one. Of these, and in fact, I thought I was maybe watching the first half of Moonraker because Jaws yeah. was in it as well. And so at that point, I kind of, kind of thought Bond was like Bond versus Jaws, if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah, and then yeah. finally, I found the the VHS section at, at the video store, and it was like, oh, okay, there, there's more of these things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but that very much got me into filmmaking. I was actually I was a member of the CommanderBond.net forums back in the day. Um, and when I was like 18, I went to Los Angeles and we had like a meetup of the people from the CommanderBond.net forums. And actually, when I was there, I, I was looking to go into law school at the time. And I actually threw that. One of the guys was like a Hollywood screenwriter and another one of them worked in like marketing at Miramax. Okay. And it was the first I'd ever met people in the film industry. And they were really like, oh, no, you know, we actually exist. You can actually sort of do this. Um, and yeah, I ended up applying for NYU film school and got in, um, yeah, and did that. And then I kind of was after my first project and one night I just went out of nowhere. What would it be like if your name was James Bond? And, and I kind of looked to see if that film already existed and, and it didn't, there were a lot of kind of various news articles about real James Bonds, Mm -hmm. but that film hadn't been made. And kind of before I knew it, I'd messaged a lot of guys called James Bond on social media and said, Hey, have you got any interesting stories to tell? And that's sort of what kicked off. Yeah. This project. Yeah. No, that's, that's good. It's quite interesting that you went to LA to do law and then got into filmmaking when a lot of people are like, they go to LA specifically to get into filmmaking or acting or such and then not struggle with it, but, but have a hard time. But then you were quite relaxed going through it and then, 
picked up on that. Yeah, it, it was it was just kind of going where, where I grew up here at the time in Adelaide, like filmmaking. What you you know those jobs where you laugh at someone for wanting to work in that industry? You know what I mean? Like, oh, you'll never make it in that. That was very much the these days. There is like a proper film industry, and especially in the UK as well. It's a really like reputable job mm-hmm. these days. But at the time, it felt really mad. If you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned um, that you just came out of nowhere, this idea, and it was like through Facebook that you found all these James Bonds and you're just messaging people. So it's you said that it, I found that it took you 10 years really in the making through the whole research and the, before filming, it took 10 years to do the whole film. So I kind of want to know how you sort of balanced your sort of time. How did you go about um, doing this? Putting it, what else were you doing? How did you find all these people? And how did you put the story together? Because 10 years is a long time to work on the, a one feature. Yeah, yeah. I would, I would say it's nine. People have rounded up to 10. I mean, I mean, we were kind of told, I think, that at least the time I was, uh, when I started is that documentaries tend to take about seven years okay. from very first conception to kind of release in the end. And, and when I started this, I was like, I, like, what's wrong with those stupid people? Like, this is going to take like a year sort of thing. Um, And then you get to your first cut and you're like, oh God, this still, this isn't just doing a few interviews and cutting them together. This is Mm -hmm. going to be a lot more work. Um, But actually, funnily enough, on the commanderbond.net thing, I actually ended up working for uh, John and Athena, who I'm sure no one one knows what I'm talking about, but they were kind of on the commanderbond.net forums. Um, and those original guys I met, I ended up working for their company, um, which is doing something called like quality control passes on films, which is essentially checking the subtitles for, okay. for like English films when they go to Europe. So it's uh, checking that not the language, but actually somebody has to check that every subtitle is actually there because when you go through post-production on a film, there's like thousands of different subtitles and they're all in different languages and for disabled people and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I was kind of working for them as their like London guy for a number of years. Um, And for this film, you know, it's made up of about 100, 300 pound shoots, if that makes sense. You know, like we would do the classic, there's a classic hack in filmmaking, which is if you hire a camera you know, filming equipment for one day on a Friday, you actually get it till Monday because you can't back on the Saturday. Um, And that was our kind of standard sort of like low budget hack. Um, And yeah, I would just kind of keep getting up enough money to go do another shoot, you know, for that weekend. And, you know, you'll see there's a lot of reenactment in the film. So it Mm -hmm. sort of became, you know, oh, we've got to go do like a World War II thing and often kind of being quite creative, um yeah in how you do things that that there was a lot of props sent back to amazon return yes yeah. <laughs> monday at times <laughs> and just all those sort of things and we just kind of slowly built it over time um yeah until we had it at a point where we felt it was working and it was good enough to like send off to film festivals and it's kind of gone from there so have yeah. you got a big team because it sounds very like indie diy is it how many of you were doing this over the years i'd say like hundreds of people have worked on the film um and we really wanted to include them all in the credits because we wanted to have the most james bondy credits <laughs> we could so we really wanted to have like you know like london unit usa yeah, yeah, yeah. unit sweden unit um kind of thing i don't know if saw at the end of the credits but we, we i was really nice having the you know like filmed on location app mm-hmm. sort of yeah. list Um, So there's been a lot of kind of pinch hitters throughout it. And then my core team back in London is I found this amazing kind of crew of students from like NFTS, which is like the National Film Television School in London, which I'd only heard of before. It's famous for, I I think it's the best school in the UK, but it's where like Roger Deakins and a lot of people went. Um, And I found some recent graduates who were really kind of wanting to do their first you know, feature film. Mm -hmm. And I kind of arrived at them a few years back now with kind of like hundreds of hours of footage and a rough cut. And it was kind of really them um, that kind of helped me sort of get there. Um, And so especially our editor, Leslie Posso, 
Um, and then she brought on our composer, a guy called like Alistair McNamara, mm-hmm. who's done the kind of score for the film. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was our kind of core team that sort of brought it together in the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. That there, you were talking about trying to get all these people from all over the the world uh, in the credits because what that's one of the things that I was thinking about in the documentary. It goes off in so many different directions. Things that when I was watching it, the story went off in places that I didn't imagine it was going to. It goes in different different tangents. And were you surprised at how varied all these different individual lives were, and how the name of James Bond yeah. can affect these people? It was very varied. Yeah, I'm glad you say that. It it was a deliberate choice we made to have you kind of always like completely unsure where this thing is going to go next. And like we, I I think with this film, people come in with certain expectations. And so, and that is, oh, there's going to be a lot of like these guys complaining about Aston Martin and Martini jokes and that kind of thing. And so in the end, we kind of got all of that out the way in an opening like five minute montage of all of Mm -hmm. that stuff. Um, and then, you know, not to spoil it, but the film then cuts to like the middle of snowy, barren Sweden and suddenly everyone's speaking Swedish. Yeah. Uh, and we wanted you to have that thing of like, oh God, where is this? Where, where is this? Where's this going next? You know? And, and then suddenly you're going to like, you know, barber shops with a lot of African Americans talking about James Bond. And we wanted to always have you going, we don't know what the next step um, here sort of is. But for us, it was, yeah, it, it, we had an initial group of guys called James Bond that we found. And, and again, I originally thought that was our film. And then kind of new ones kept coming up. Obviously, I've kind of got a lot of weird alerts for, like, guys called James Bond or Google <laughs> or whatever. Um, and the two major ones that came up was the, there's the the guy who's in prison for murder yeah. um, on a murder charge in the film. And that just came up. It was actually during our first shoot. And I missed it at the time, but it was during our first shoot is when the murder and the arrest happened. Mm -hmm. Um, And obviously it was like, there's a guy called James Bond. who has been charged with murder. All the media reports are like, James Bond was in a shootout, (laughs) you know? And so I wrote to him in prison thinking he'd never do it, you you know, but I was like, I have to try this. Um, And being Americans, he really wanted to do it. <laughs> he wanted to be in the movie and his whole family was really into it. Um, and then he, one of the news reports we saw was that it, it was a story and you see it in the film. It was man called James Bond confused for murder suspect. And the media had found another guy in yeah. the same town That's right. who yeah, was yeah. called James uh-huh. Bond. And about how he was getting calls at his work. And he's like a, a yes, MAGA yes. hat wearing gun nut. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. he was getting phone calls at work thinking he was the guy who'd committed the shooting. Yeah. And so we then found him and he agreed to do it as well. And uh-huh. so that became a big part of it. Um, and then you, I'm sure you guys have questions about him, but we've got the Swedish James Bond, who is yes. a man in Sweden who has literally in every way turned himself into James Bond. And originally he was everything I didn't want in the film, because obviously (laughs) when you go searching for real James Bonds on Google, Uh you come across a lot of like looky likes, you know, Uh you go to birthday parties and things dressed as James Bond. And that was everything we didn't want. Um, But actually we had, He's quite controversial in Sweden and a lot of the Swedish James Bond fans really, because they're quite serious and they really don't like, him and one of them wrote to me and said i've heard about your film i'm really (laughs) glad you the swedish james bond isn't in your movie Uh, and i was like i've never heard of the swedish james bond like (laughs) google swedish james bond and he popped up um and then obviously when we heard his whole story it made sense to include him in the film and we also needed a counterpoint because there's a lot of guys in this film who hate being james bond um also know nothing about the james bond films whereas he allowed us to really get this kind of actual James Bond energy um, sort of in there as well. But, yes, it, it went off in, in unexpected directions. Yeah. Because we, we thought with, is it Gunter? Gunter's his real name? Gunnar is Gunnar. his name, yes. Um, with him, because it came on saying, oh, I drink Bollinger every day and this is my ass And I was like, where are you affording this? <laughs> like, where are you getting the money for this? Unless he is a contract killer, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it yep. was it was good for that. And something that I actually really liked about 
the document is is being a, a James Bond fan. As I sat waiting to watch a documentary almost about James Bond, but it wasn't really like that. Like as, as Jack says, it goes in different avenues. You don't need to be a James Bond fan. You don't really have need to have ever seen a James Bond movie to watch this documentary and enjoy it because it is about the kind of double edged sword of being called essentially a character from fiction, a very, very well-known character, where you do have people who really embrace it and essentially want to be James Bond. Then you've got people who see the name as a bit of a curse. The The director, was it, no, the theatre producer from, from New York, he was like, I felt like he was almost torn apart with the name because mm. he hated it, but then he was getting offered money to go and be For an advert and such. And you're yeah. like, well, where... Where's where's obviously you've got the name, you're gonna use the name, and then you have the extreme of someone changing the yeah. name entirely, just not wanting to be called James Bond at all. So it's quite interesting from that point. And a question I'd quite like to know, and I don't want to spoil this too much for anyone who's not seen the documentary, and I don't want to give too much away. And there might be certain details that you actually can't tell us here, but there is a yeah. James, there is a James Bond who is called James Bond to not be found. How did you find them? Yeah, yeah, that's a good, and uh, I'll kind of step around some kind of spoilers for, <laughs> for, the, for the film with it. But, um, yeah, we, obviously a big thing that emerged in the film, and it actually comes back to my original search for these guys, mm-hmm. because James Bond is quite hard to find mm-hmm. on the internet, you, you know, and you kind of end up having to do things like you Google James, you know, on Google advanced search, you can, like, exclude search terms. Yeah. So you got to go James Bond and then exclude, you know, Martini, Aston Martin, 007, whatever, to kind of get down to them. Um, and even on Facebook, then none of them are James Bond on Facebook because it doesn't let you join. As It's the same as if you tried to join Facebook to Tom Cruise. It says you can't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they're all Bond James or JB Bond mm-hmm. or sort of whatever. Um, so the ones on Facebook that I found, and um, I can't tell you what his derivation is, but it was a variation on James Bond, and all of them I messaged were Bond James, or uh, some of them are literally James with like four S's Bond <laughs> on there. But weirdly, when you see that, you actually go, ah, that is a real guy called James Bond who's uh-huh. had to get around on the Facebook yeah. sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I just wrote to a bunch of them. Um, yeah. And one of them who wrote back told me this story about how he, he'd had to change his identity because he was hiding from some elements in his past. Mm. And at first I went, that doesn't make any sense at all. And actually often when I tell people mm. that story from the film without seeing the film, it actually doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and actually, in a way, the entire film is teaching you all of these weird intricacies of having the name James Bond so that yeah. when that reveal happens, it's not like, what the hell? It's like, oh, God, that's a crazy idea, but it's actually really good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but but he he kind of explained that to me. And then when I met the other James Bonds, they started saying the same thing and Weird things started happening. So, say the New York James Bond who you're talking about Mm -hmm. who, um, you know, complains a lot. Like, he (laughs) complains a lot. That's his thing. But one of his complaints is that as a New York theatre director, he'll have a review of one of his, you know, shows in the New York Times. And you can't Google that review because if you Google James Bond New York Times review... Mm -hmm. You obviously get reviews of all the Bond films and that kind of thing. And he's got this big complaint that he's nine pages down on Google when you try and do that search. But when he started saying that kind of thing, I was like, oh, God, that other story that I've heard is actually starting to make a lot more sense. Um, And then obviously in the edit of the film, it allowed us to sort of cut between those two things at like a key moment. Um, yeah, but yeah, I, I found I, I found him by chance. So is 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 the long way to get to it. Um, yeah, it's quite good that because it is it's a documentary, but it is storytelling. As you said, you're you're moving up and down. You're going from essentially good and the bad, kind of ping ponging back together. Then you found someone who's used the name almost like a tool to hide, and you've always get the point yep. of the two James Bonds um, in the same town together where. 
one has had a much worse time than the other. And they didn't and know each other. Obviously meeting each other yes. as well, yeah. which was interesting and explaining their, their kind of different stories for that. So yeah, it does take a lot and as I said, you, you don't really need to be a James Bond fan to watch it. It is just, no. It's just interesting I, I, to see how yeah. this, this has panned out. Yeah, we, we did want it to be universal. And I will say, the way we actually came across you guys is you guys did your On Her Majesty's Secret Service mm-hmm. video. And I think you, you kind of mentioned our film. Yes, and I think uh, yeah. you referred to it as a fan film at the time. <laughs> I will say, I was like, please don't call that. So we really wanted to avoid <laughs> A a we you know how you have those like fan films and there's a lot of them on kind of YouTube and, yeah, and kind yeah, of stuff mm-hmm. and we didn't we really didn't want to be like like a fan film because kind of going out into you know the film festival market and that kind mm-hmm. of thing we really wanted to kind of push this as you know this is its own thing and it's kind of its own documentary mm-hmm. this isn't like a Bond fan thing. Um, and so we did sort of want something a little bit more kind of universal, I guess, yeah. and something that felt a bit more like something you would just come across on Netflix um, or something. And so we were kind of careful to avoid, you, you know, how they're all kind of filmed on kind of like a standard kind of grey background, for yeah, instance, the uh, interviews yeah. in this film. Whereas, like, you know how, like, when you watch them, it's kind of almost more like a fan film. You have a lot of scenes at things like Comic-Con or yeah, something, or like yeah, yeah. a James Bond convention, or like even in the interviews, they're always sort of sitting in kind of kind of like a bit of like a studio where you guys are, but then there's like an old movie poster, yeah, oh, and like yeah, a star uh-huh. on the wall behind them, and it kind of like like there's a new film, and and I, I'm sure it's really good, but there's a new film about the like the Star Wars holiday special, <laughs> and it's one of those real like kind of like geek doc movies yeah. if you know uh-huh. what yeah. i mean Which this is like, nothing like that this yeah. is nothing like that yeah we, we wanted to not uh-huh. be that uh-huh. you know and i think weirdly a lot of guys who've seen this film have said like that their wives and girlfriends really enjoyed it and actually for the first time they were really happy to sit down and watch a piece of james bond you yeah. know sort of entertainment um so yeah we did want it to be sort of bored mm. i think even the title as well the title's quite ambiguous it's it's the other fellow, which you recognise as a James Bond fan, but to someone who has never seen on a Magic Secret Service, it's a title, yep. and then it, it has the small kind of snippet to explain that as well. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's that there's like, for us, we were like, I, I was never sure, because I'm a Bond fan, and actually if you're a Bond fan, it's a really niche, it's just mm-hmm. not a niche James Bond reference, but it is, you know, you know like a Bond fan will get it. Mm-hmm. And I was worried that other people wouldn't get it and my crew who aren't Bond fans were like yeah your film's about like another guy you know it's about someone dealing with someone else but if you know the reference in the film obviously for me it was like George Lazenby is talking about him living in the shadow of a far more famous Mm -hmm. James Bond Um, and it was like oh god that is exactly the situation you know these guys sort of find themselves in so it, it made sense I was I was surprised it stuck. I thought some distributor or someone would change the title to My Name is Bond, James Bond yeah. or something, but oddly stuck, actually. Mm-hmm. Did did you ever get, like, contacted by anybody in, like, the Bond um, filmmaking, like a broccoli or an actor or somebody, or did you reach out to them to be part of it? No, I, I'll, I'll tell you what, we, I did send them a letter, as, as many okay. Bond fans have. I sent a letter to, to, to Eon Productions at one point during this, um, but they, I, I've kind of, kind of learned later, they essentially have like a pretty closed door policy okay. to, to, to kind of anything. And, and you can only imagine, weirdly enough, the Swedish James Bond actually gets a lot of these emails because there are people out there that kind of confuse, you know, he's like the James Bond museum. People yeah, kind yeah. of confuse him for something official. Um, and actually, we, this sounds like a weird tangent, but... It is a weird tangent, but you know how, like, say, like, 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 bu- say, like, Buckingham Palace, they have to deal with a lot of kind of like schizophrenic and mentally ill people who think they're they're like the Queen's son or something, or they have some kind of weird ties to the royal family. You know, these guys that like show up trying to break into Buckingham Palace oh, yeah, or whatever, yeah. um, and so. James in the in the museum sometimes gets cc'd 
on these kind of quite weird garbled emails where it'll be like trying to write to like him and Barbara Broccoli and Michael <laughs> Jules and, yeah, yeah. you know, with a weird like I am James Bond or I am actually James Bond's son or yeah, do you yeah. know what I mean? People in kind of mental confusion mm-hmm. who have seen James Bond out there in the media sphere and it's sort of become part of that. Um, but anyway, that, that aside, <laughs> um, I, I wrote, into them and later i kind of found out that it, so if you're like a film production company mm-hmm. you you can't really take like under sort of like cold scripts and stuff in because mm-hmm. say if a guy in china writes his script for the new james bond movie yeah, and it's yeah. in china and there's like a motorcycle chase on the great wall of china for instance if they accepted that script from him and in 10 years time, they wanted to do a motorcycle chase on the great wall of China, that guy could say, you plagiarize my script. And so I think they've got a pretty closed door policy to like anything. And, and, you know, speaking with a lot of guys, it's obviously like we've made a film here, but actually most James Bond stuff out there is kind of unofficial. Do you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. you guys, for instance, and the podcasts and all the, magazines and books and all of that kind of thing um i think they do keep like a bit of a wall sort of between these things um but but daniel craig's brother came to one of us (laughs) so we we filmed we screened the film um up in a place um called oswestry um which is it's it's kind of in like shrewsbury kind of in northernish england sort of thing and they said to us you're not going to be with this, but Daniel Craig's brother actually works in Wrexham, which is the next town over. Why don't we ask Daniel Craig's brother along? Because obviously he would sort of understand in a different way the themes yeah, yeah, uh-huh. you know, of the film, living in the shadow of, of a more famous James Bond. Um, and so I showed up at the screening and they had, you know, like a seat reserved for me. And then next to me was, was Daniel Craig. I'm not going to say his name because he's quite private. Did it just say um, Daniel Craig's brother? <laughs> It was Daniel Craig's brother, yeah, and he actually rocked up a bit late. So when he showed up, I kind of had to fill him in and what had happened on the film so far. Um, I, and yeah, and then yeah, he got up with me at this place and we kind of did a little Q and A together. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was really interesting seeing what he, you, you know, thought of it and the experience he'd been through. And he's been through similar things. So like the Daily Mail got a photographer with a long lens mm-hmm. to photograph him at work. And then did, you know, a big, when No Time to Die came out, did a big article about like, oh, look, you know, look at Daniel Craig's brother, you know, it's just a good working class guy and then comparing him to his brother on the red carpet. Yeah. Um, and so, look, I, I, part of me, maybe at Christmas dinner this year, maybe he had a chat with Rachel and Daniel <laughs> and said maybe. there's this film yeah. <laughs> out there. Um, yeah, who knows? I'd like to think they would have watched it. There's no reason that they wouldn't have. Especially, I think I think Barbara Broccoli definitely would have watched it. Just to see what was going on. I, I, I would like to think they have, or they might at some point. Maybe, you know what, now that it's on the plane, mm-hmm. I think there's a good chance that they <laughs> might end up watching it on the plane yeah. uh, at some point. And I think they'd really enjoy it. I mean, it, it A, celebrates the impact and in some yeah. good ways by the end that their legacy, you know, their family legacy has had. Mm-hmm. It also, though, it actually does tell the, the you know, we all know the Ian Fleming stole the name James Bond mm-hmm. from the ornithologist. We've all heard that story. Um, but the film actually does tell that story fully kind of in a way that's never been done before. Mm-hmm. And I think it covers an area of especially like Ian Fleming history that I don't think has been covered on film before. And so mm-hmm. I think on that angle, they'd probably find it interesting um, as well. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. Cause if I you think if you're his only podcast, Barbara. Um, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Oh, she wasn't there. What does not? I think uh, I thought that was quite interesting as well. When you were mentioning the, that interaction that no one will have seen before, because everyone had heard about the, the book side of things, but they've just put the name, but I didn't know about what went on after that. Like, I didn't know the James Bond, the actual ornithologist James Bond, knew about this. And then when you piece that together with the actual footage at GoldenEye, and then along with the actors and the, the dramatisation, I think I recognised one of the actors playing James Bond. I was like, 
I've seen him in TV before. Uh, that was President uh, Logan from Twenty Four. I think he was in. Oh. I think it was the Mentalist. I think I've seen him in. But um, yeah. yeah, it was it was quite good to see that because then it, it fleshed out the story. There was always the, the, the dramatization throughout the the episode as well, just to so people can visualize what actually happened. But yeah, I, I found that quite interesting. I think um, just as we're talking about Barbara Broccoli there, in terms of some personal questions, and there's no there's no right or wrong answers here, so you don't have to worry, Matt. If Barbara Broccoli got in touch with you and said, I would like you to get involved in the creation of the next James Bond, what kind of direction are you thinking? What, uh, yeah, what, what, what a question. Um, I mean, look, we all have our kind of like what you would do with a Bond movie thing. I, I would do what apparently according to, and of course we all know that, most James Bond media reports are completely fabricated <laughs> nonsense. Um, but there were reports last week that what Nolan had wanted to do was like a 1950s, you know, original right, throwback. Right. And that's mm-hmm. definitely, I think, is the angle I would want to do with the series. At this point, though, mm-hmm. like I think, you know, when when Craig came in, I think it was right to do the young James mm-hmm. Bond in a modern era kind of thing. Um, but... As something of a fan of the books, I I think what a lot of people miss is, you know, I think in popular culture, James Bond is very tied to the 60s. And I think kind of because of Austin Powers, especially that we see that as where James Bond is from. But it's it's not the the Bond books are these like 1950s, like Cold War spy thrillers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in that kind of way, they've never actually been adapted you know, for that era. And I would bet the reason they wouldn't want to do it is because the product placements become hard, you, yeah, you know. Sure. But you can still have British Airways <laughs> and Aston Martin back mm-hmm. in those days. But I, I kind of think that doing a really kind of expensive, lush 1950s James Bond, do you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. not kind of gritty, like, you know, like expensive, you know what I mean? Like, James uh-huh. Bond really arriving at the most, like, lavish 1950s casino, mm-hmm. um, I think could be, like, really amazing. Um, yeah, I think that would be cool. I've always, I've always got a dr- I, I, I've got, a, always got a dream James Bond sequence in my head, and, you know, I, I, I don't want to let it out just in case I ever get to do it or yeah. some version of it. In case Barbara One steals day. it. Yeah. <laughs> I've always, I've always, I've always had, a, I've always had an opening scene. I've got a really good opening sequence. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, yes, and I'm not sure what the, re- you know, it's always Bond chasing Spectre or something. But yes, I, cause especially after so many films, you go like, what's left? Yeah, you, what's you, you know, but I think I've got one new idea mm-hmm. for a Bond film. Yeah, well, we actually did. Could we just talk about this now. We actually did a music video. Yeah, uh, we we used to be in a band. That's how we we know each other. Yeah, a and rock back band. Right. in two thousand and twenty, we did a. It was a music video that turned out to be essentially like a nine minute short film where the okay. song was called "Fallen for a Spy," and we brought it out because okay. no time that I had been delayed, 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 and we thought I oh, would like to do a James Bond song, much in the style of like Chris Cornell. So we wrote an original song, did a music video, and it was it was just stealing from. The movies, you know, yeah. in a casino. We had an Aston Martin. Yeah. I can't remember how we got that, but it was it was all that, and it was just throwing ideas and just see what it's going and see see what it was quite fun. Yeah, we I created a little, about that. a little yeah short film just because if yeah. the actual No Time to Die had been delayed and delayed, and Billie Eilish's song came out, and we were like, well, I think we can do it better, so we did a rock song, and we were like, well, we need to but do it. Was, it. it was COVID with nothing to do. <laughs> so you can do anything except that. <laughs> You can do it better, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, it's really sad. I mean, I think everyone's got, I think as Bond fans, we've all kind of got our own version of that. And I don't mean this in a rude way. It's what we were trying to avoid with this. Like, we really Uh wanted to make sure we weren't doing something that resembled like a James Bond Uh fan Mm -hmm. YouTube video or something. But I think we've all done that. I mean, my first film at high school was was me and my friend were playing to like agents for oh god whenever i do that with my fingers <laughs> the wounds come up i don't know what i, I don't thought know that was us <laughs> it happened, it happened before. 
Thank God it's just it's like something out of a, a title sequence. Um, but no, me and my friend were playing like agents of our school's headmaster who was like M. And okay. we'd been like, you know, like given the task of like, like hunting down this like villainous bully in the school. And it, and it was all of us like, you know, like jumping off every school balcony and that kind of thing. And of mm-hmm. course, like all of the music was like David Arnold's Bond score or uh-huh. kind of whatever. Um, and I, I think everyone's had their sort of thing with that. But yeah, I'm sure your song was good. And there's there's a whole thing on YouTube these days, which is all of the Bond songs that never... I think it's Blur did a Spectre song. Oh, Radiohead. Radiohead, Radio. yeah. And so, someone, for some reason, did, did... They made the credits as if it was yeah. the credit... Of the, James of, Bond of the movie, credits yeah. for The Empire Strikes Back. And then they put it <laughs> on there. And it's like, it's it's really good. But yeah, th- that song is like definitely better than, than the Spectre song. Than um, the writers know. Yeah, because oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, we, we it was the, the James Bond music documentary. And I never knew about that. And then when I listened to the song at the end, I was like, I'm not the biggest Radiohead fan, but I was like, that just, that's just better. There's more emotion through it. It's more grandiose at the yeah. end. And thought it'd be good, but yeah. we don't make the decisions. No. <laughs> it's, not, it's not our no, job. No. <laughs> um, I've got a fun question for you, Matt. So uh, with our podcast, what we do is we have like a special mini series where we um, sort of recast old James Bond films. So if we were making um, Goldfinger now, <laughs> but set in the 50s and 60s, like you were suggesting, like who would we get to play James Bond who would be the villain, what modern actor would recreate the role. So I want to know, sure. for your favourite film, whatever it might be, who would be your Bond villain and Bond girl and James Bond? Yeah, okay. I mean, I said, fun, weirdly enough, I was watching your On Her Majesty's Secret Service video l- last night, and weirdly, I've actually been doing the same thing you guys have been doing on your podcast, so I've finally been re-watching all the James Bond films in order, which right. I've never done before. I've always watched them completely out of order, and it's a, it's a really different experience yeah. doing it like this, but now that this bloody documentary is finished, I can finally like yeah. watch the Bond films in peace again. Um, so I would say it's probably on Her Majesty's Secret Service. I know you guys have some contra- controversial opinions on that point, but it's also the last one I watched. And actually, I hadn't seen it in years, and I just, like, I, it was like a revelation to me the other night how much I just, like, loved this film. And it's it's a good place for this question because I think George Lazenby is the worst James Bond, and, and it's always the problem for me with that with that movie, um, you know. So the the obvious thing would be I would recast. People always talk about what if Sean Connery was in mm. On Her Majesty's Secret Service, and but I, I was I also... I believe that would be good. Uh-huh. I think that would be good. Yeah. You said that would be it the would, best it, James Bond film ever. Yes. Sean Connery if Sean Connery was in that role, yeah. and yeah, it would. It would also be like the best ever ending to a Bond range. You know what I mean? It would be yeah. like what yeah. No Time to Die was trying to be. Mm-hmm. And it would be really exactly. bad. But I was also going, what if Rog- What if this was Roger Moore's first as well? And then it would have been a kickoff to his tenure like Casino Royale was, you know what I mean, with this mm-hmm. very kind of emotional kind of film. Um, yeah. It's a- anyway, that's what goes through your head a bit. From today, who would you get to play James Bond today? I never have any idea on this question. You know when people are like, who would be a good next James Bond? Yeah. I, I, and I think they're struggling with it at the moment. Yeah. Like, right now, it's hard to kind of go, y- you know, that that person mm. would work. I, I don't know. I heard something about, like, Cal- I think his name's Callum Turner or something from that BBC series or whatever. I, I thought he'd be all right. But I don't know. I don't, I don't know if anyone, like, particularly sort of sticks out. Um, yeah, yeah. Who would play Blofeld? I don't know. I, 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 yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I'm sorry, I'm not great on the James Bond. <laughs> I'm just James putting you on the spot casting. here. When, when we did a casting, I think we both just thought yes. of a bald man and went Mark Strong. Just yeah. immediately, villain, bald man, that's yeah. fine. But then that's a bit obvious. My, my guy was the, the villain from The Mummy. <coughs> He's, he was bald. Yes. And uh-huh. He could be a good... Mm-hmm. Yeah. For, for years, it was always Kevin Spacey is going to play Blofeld. You know, you know yeah. the, the son article it was always he was always going to be the maybe blow and i think he ended up playing like lex luther oh, i yeah, think those are right. kind of combined 
Um, yeah, and then as, yeah, as as a as a Tracy Bond, I'm not sure she's amazing. By that, seeing that film again the other night, I was like, she's 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 very good. Mm. Um, yeah, I think that's easy. I think you can very easily imagine like like weirdly enough, Gemma Arterton comes to mind. You, you know, even though she's already mm. in in one, you know, but I think that would be easy casting like a quite a prim proper young yeah uh, okay. actress. In that, yeah, you're right. Blofeld, it's always like who's bald, <laughs> <laughs> who's you willing, know, who's and, willing and, to shoot. And you've had a few years. I'm sure Anthony Hopkins has been rumored as a Blofeld. You, you know, over time, there's always those same names that always sort of get thrown out. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the Bond films do well. I mean, you kind of forget that like Mads Mikkelsen was kind of an unknown. Yeah, yeah. You know, Cinerial kind of came out, and everyone was like. You know, because you know, everyone's going, oh, it's going to be, you, you know, Anthony Hopkins as Le Chief <laughs> or something, you know. But I think they do do tend to do quite well when there is, like, some unknown European that's not sort of bringing baggage yeah. Yeah. with it. You know, he, and he made when you that look at it with the recent unique. films. Sorry? He made that role something unique in a, in a way that you couldn't yeah. see anyone else playing Le Chiffre other than Mads Mikkelsen. Even when you see him after that, you're just... There's Le Chief mm-hmm. all the time, and I think that's yeah, pretty good about yeah. it. And it's weird. Now you watch Cinereal again, and you're like, Mads Mikkelsen's in this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Um, yeah. But I think it is often going against type with it a bit as well. You know, it's mm-hmm. kind of like, you know, when they put, like, Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight. People were like, uh, what? Yeah. You know, after years of, will it be Robin Williams or Jim Carrey as the Joker <laughs> rumors? It's suddenly yeah. Heath Ledger. You know? But I think... Even with Daniel Craig, you know, people were like, what the, you know, what, what is, what is this, you know? But I think those smart casting people kind of see something beyond just yeah th- that kind of surface level, you know, stuff or even like, oh, do they have the right accent, you know, or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. I suppose that's their job. Not good. Not good. Yeah. Well, we're almost going to kind of wrap up here. Uh, Matt, I don't want to cool. take up too much of your, your morning. Get on with your sunny day. We are still jealous at how warm it is in Australia. <laughs> I'm um, going back to bed, but yes. Go ahead yes. Bed. <laughs> Sorry for waking you up. Um, <laughs> as I mentioned at the start, well, obviously we've spoke about the other fellow. We've had a, a a number of different questions with that. We hope some of these questions have actually whetted your your appetite, appetite, appetite um, to go and watch it. As we said before, you don't need to be a Bond fan to go and enjoy it. You can enjoy it still as a Bond fan, and I hope we didn't give too much away with the, the questions and answers. But just before we, we kind of wrap up here, Matt, I do have a, a quick question for you, which is not really about the kind of Bond side of things. I was seeing that you were actually looking into doing a documentary um, called Ethanol. Is that yes. Correct? What can you tell us about that? Because when I looked at the small synopsis, yeah. I thought, that's very interesting, and I have never heard of anyone doing something like that before. I think it could be good. Yeah, and, and it's weird. I think off with filmmaking, you kind of think of an idea and then you look, of, you assume someone else has done it. And then if not, you kind of go, well, maybe that's that, that's the next film. Mm-hmm. But yeah, ethanol is the actual drug that we're taking when we drink mm-hmm. alcohol, um, you know, and it's 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 a film. It's it's you, you would think that there is an alcohol documentary. It's like you would swear there's an alcohol mm-hmm. documentary. Um, and it's like I... I, I don't drink, but it was after struggling with that for many years. And when I was, I went looking for the alcohol documentary and I was like, it doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. And it, it's weird. I mean, if you go to a Netflix queue, there's like 50 cocaine documentaries, but yeah, there isn't yeah. one about what is the world's largest drug problem. Um, and the film is deliberately called Ethanol because it's about reshaping kind of like, you know, the the drinking culture or the drinking mm. problem as as a mass drug problem which mm. is what it is um and the film is looking yeah pretty hardcore into you know what are the kind of grand sort of worldwide effects of, of this problem um you know which is a very big problem i mean i mean you, you hear about you know oxycontin or fentanyl yeah. and you know all these other kind of like massive kind of drug killer problems um, but, you know, alcohol or ethanol, um, you know, kills more people worldwide every year than all of these other drugs combined. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it kills as many people as COVID, y- mm-hmm. you know, every year. It's absolutely massive. And But I think our society has this weird perception of yeah. it as somehow very different mm-hmm. to these other things. 
Um, and I think the film is not asking people not to drink, but it's probably asking people to kind of like look at what this this thing for what it really is. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's that's my next project. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I have a, a weird habit of kind of like always like kind of going after you know, like my heroes when I was growing up, <laughs> like it was yeah. James Bond last time. Um, uh, you, you know, and I think there is something, yeah, yeah, I don't know, there's something in that. But it is, I mean, for me, it was like James Bond and drinking were very tied together <laughs> yeah. for me. Do you yeah. know, what I mean? like for my entire 20s, mm-hmm. I was a, a chain smoking, whiskey drinking, you know, adventurer, you know, thinking that made me the coolest man alive. Um, you know, and I think that somehow does... Yeah, I, I think there is a tie with the shaken, not stirred kind mm-hmm. of thing, mm-hmm. you, you know. Um, yes, I, I could go on. It's weird. There's a lot of bans on alcohol advertising out there, and the way you get around it is either sporting events because you can't stop five-year-olds watching the football. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you also mm-hmm. do it through tie-ins in films and that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but yes, that's my next film. Yeah, yes. no, I think it's uh, just that one sentence I've seen it, I thought, that, sounds, that just sounds interesting. As you said, there's, there would have been nothing, there would have been nothing, there doesn't been anything kind of made on it already. And given the fact that it is legal in most places and also marketed as well, is quite unusual for, for a drug. Um, but I think that's all the questions we've got. Yeah. As we've said already, the other fellow is on ITVX and Prime and... On your flights for Emirates and American Airlines, if you're lucky enough to be to be flying, um, we hope you go and watch the, the documentary. It is very very enjoyable. We hope yes. you've enjoyed this episode, and we'd both like to thank Matt for for joining us to Thanks be our coming, first Matt. guest ever on the the podcast. And um, and yeah, thank you very much for for being with us, Matt. Awesome guys, really nice meeting you as well. Thank you for having me on. Likewise, we'll let you get away to your bed now. <laughs> yeah. <definitely. laughs> Very nice meeting you guys. I'll catch you later. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye.